chopped off heads, thick heads and blood. To me, riffs are fucking timeless. You've got generations of people going to see them. It's our best album so far. The fans have been asking for it. They've been asking for it for years. I would listen to it over and over and over again today. It's like music we play, man. You're either going to like it or not. There are satanic bands. Some of them really aren't. We're playing the craziest drunken debauchery show we've played probably ever. It is not as conducive to be doing a podcast. You're listening to The Great Metal Debate Podcast. Hey, Brian, we're back on the show. What's been going on, man? Not a lot, man. I've uh, been to a show and listened to a lot of good metal. And uh, what are you been up to? I'm excited that you and I, after six or seven months, finally got to go to a show again together. Oh, dude, and we, we, we picked a doozy to go to. We really did. It was the Three Tremors Tour, of course, with uh, three great singers in that band, which we'll talk about in a little bit. I had a couple of opening bands. It was at the Tiger Room. I understand why they call it a Tiger Room. It made me roar a couple of times because, you know, it also happens to be a very popular strip club. One side bands play and the other side girls play. And... That's a great combination. And one of the three trimmers had something quite direct to say about that, didn't they? (laughs) He did. He very lovingly called them whores. I'm sure he didn't mean anything by it. But, you know, uh, he had some form of appreciation for it. So you got to give him credit for something there. Man, I was excited to see the three trimmers. A couple of friends of the podcast, Tim Ripper Owens, and then also Sean the Hell Destroyer Peck. Both live in Kentucky, our own home state. It was awesome to get to see a band with those great singers live. Oh, dude, seeing them live was incredible. Uh, Listen, there was an opening band that was their first show, Mass Asylum. And they're going to be good, I think. I, I like their music. It was just obviously a new start for them. And then the second band that came on was Storm Toker. And they were sort of an alt, uh, new metal band. Uh, I enjoyed them a lot. Uh, they kept my interest. Brian, I, I was hoping to see them on April 20th. I wonder why. I think there probably had already been some storm token going on. But, you know. And then the three trimmers came on. And I'm telling you, man, they set off a metal bomb in that place. The, the place came alive. The crowd came alive. The metal came alive. Up to that point, the show had been kind of ill-defined. You, you really... Didn't know what you were there for, but when these three guys got out there and started screaming with the backing of the band, that's basically Sean Peck's band, Cage, it was incredible. We were up close, we were on the barrier, and they were very down in your face. It was fun, it was loud, it was aggressive. My ears still hurt from that concert. Man, I was so excited. You basically got the Cage band, and I'm a huge fan of Cage. True metal isn't really my thing. I've got to give props to a band who executes that genre as flawlessly as anyone can. Cage is the ultimate true metal band in my estimation. And we got to see them live with the addition of Harry Conklin and Tim Ripper Owens. You can't ask for more than that. You know, Conklin was the one I hadn't heard the most of. I was aware of his his body of work. And I'd listened to some of it, a lot of it, but man, he was so freaking powerful. You know, I, it's hard to say who had the most powerful voice. I'm not sure I'd want to pick one. That's like picking your favorite children. But he was very, very surprising to me in, in, in that he kept up with those two other guys at least. And, and I tell you what, Sean Peck puts out so much metal music. He is the quintessential true power metal guy. Everything about his life is metal, from the attitude to the music to his looks. If it's true metal, Sean Peck's in it. And it had been almost two decades since I'd seen Tim Ripper Owens perform. Uh, Previously, I had seen him on the Jugulator Tour with Judas Priest. And then following that, a couple of different times with Judas Priest. Amazing singer. But to see him now singing those three Tremor songs, as well as a couple of Priest classics, his voice has stood the test of time. And he continues to crank it out. Oh, dude, uh, 
I saw him once when he played with uh, the Apiece drummer guy, Vinny or uh, Carmine. I don't forget which one. And they were like the Black Knights Rising or something. And they they he were they were incredible on that. They sang old Black Sabbath songs and some Rainbow. And he is just <clears throat> it's it's hard to describe his singing. He has a range, a range of screaming and a range of of, of singing. And, and he's a true metal talent. There's just no doubt about it. Brian, I never got to see him with Ice Earth, but I think those two albums he did with Ice Earth were among that band's best. Just amazing. Man, he I wails. Just, he he was at the apex of his talent with those albums. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, they're, they're great. Those, I mean, the, the one he did about patriotism, and it's amazing. That album is incredible. I, of course, Ice, Ice Earth always has great singers. They still have got a great singer in Steve Lockett. But, but Tim Ripper Owens is a is a metal, I don't know, treasure, icon. I don't want to sound too gay about it, but I mean, I really I call, appreciate the value he has for the music. Brian, I call him the metal savior. He swooped in and yeah. saved Judas Priest when they were without Rob Halford. He swooped in Absolutely. and saved Ice Earth. He has sung for Ingve Malmsteen. He has done so much. He, I mean, I... I, I I have so much respect for that guy, how he has stood in and essentially become the metal evangelist, like John the Baptist in the wild, preaching the gospel of metal. Dude, you've got me thinking. We might want to build some sort of altar or church to him now. I mean, that's a serious, that, that's a serious observation there. I like that, man. The Church of Ripper. Let's do it. And then he'll come and sing, and it will burn down. And I will offer him, oh, oh, okay. For the law enforcement people who are listening, I'd like to just disavow myself from what he just said. Thank you. What's a metal podcast without some killer metal music? First up, we have Blood Wolf, a heavy metal band from northern New Mexico with their track 1680.
listening to 1680 from Southwest U.S. Thrasher's Blood Wolf off their eponymous album released in 2019. Oh, dude, if, if this is indicative of the Blood Wolf, then I want to be part of the pack, man. I really, really like this song. Uh, I like this band. Uh, the production, you get, it, probably a new band, but, man, I tell you what, if they get this produced well and get it uh, put together well, I think they've got, uh, I think they've got potential. Brian, you and I have talked over the months and even years about metal of the past. I want to talk about metal of the future. Okay, yeah, man. That's, that sounds like a good topic, man. I mean, I, I, I'm assuming we're going to talk about the evolution of the music if that's what you think indeed is going to happen. I, I know that this will be easy for you because 10 years ago you liked real metal and now you like bullshit and still call it metal. So I'm sure that something similar to that is going to happen in the next 10 years. Brian, I'm just curious, what will heavy metal sound like in 2030? When we first started talking about this, I, I, I actually sat down and thought about it. You know, I mean, disco evolved into techno and dance music, and, you know, uh, country has evolved into rockabilly and pop country. Punk evolved into metal, which evolved into grunge, which it, is now no, back to metal, and, and now uh, is synth metal. Punk did not evolve and, and into metal. So, are you claiming that all real metal dude, is actually punk? Listen to the guys that were here that's, in the 80s. That's they so talked about the influence that, metal, that punk had on them. You're, they talked about the influence that punk had. You are a traitor to metal to say oh, that what a dick. You don't even know. all metal is punk. That you're a traitor you know, you, to metal... You should be shot. You call me a traitor to metal. You call me a traitor to metal is kind of like a compliment to me because you don't know what metal is. Hard, aggressive, think, loud, guitar driven, oh, four four time music. It's, it's ridiculous. You're Oh, you should put a violin in there. Someone's gonna start learning how to fart through distortion and you're gonna call that metal too. The reason I thought of this question, Brian, the thought that so many metal fans in 2019, their evening of metal is listening to a tribute band play metal from 25 years earlier. So well, you know, I, some I metal just, fans stay loyal to metal. So I wonder to myself, in 2030, what's going to happen? Are we going to be having tribute bands who are playing music from 2020? Like, what's the logical outcome of that? To me, it seems like a dystopian world. You are an anomaly. You, where we're you locked hate... into nostalgia. Oh, that's exactly what I was going to talk about. I'm glad you brought that up. You are an anomaly. Almost every human being on this planet gets great comfort from nostalgia. They don't have to have it. They can move on. They often do. They always do. They have to. But they look back in fondness. And that's what you can't do for some reason. You think if you look back that you're somehow betraying your current self. Nostalgia is one of the most powerful forces on the planet. That's why 25 years later they go listen to cover bands. And I guarantee you 25 years from now, they're going to go back and listen to metal that uh, well, I loosely call it metal, the kind of stuff that you like today. They'll have cover bands for that and people will love it. You will love it, my friend. This is really disturbing because I, I would use the analogy of opium. If you have half your body blown off by a landmine, opium will give you comfort and make you feel better. But if you look down, the lower half of your body has just been blown off by a landmine. You're not in a good situation. So comfort is a, is a poor measure of what is or isn't good or right. And I just say comforting music from the past is a poor measure of actually good music. So you would actually deny the guy who got his body blown in half opium because you don't want him to be comforted. You want him to live in the now. I would, just, I, would just say, I would just say that that person is not themselves. You, for some reason, will not look at the comfort that music brings. And if you find comfort in it, you're like, I'm stagnating, I can't grow. You're one of these artists that, that, that can't listen to any other music except the new. And I think you miss out on the joys from the past, present, and the future by having to constantly look forward. Your loyalties will change, not because of the music, because of the timing. 
it's not loyalty when you talk about comfort you let you're living in fear you're living in fear of change you're like i've got to go back to this imagined time in my past where everything was wonderful it's it's frankly pathetic well here's the thing about that statement that may be a true statement that may be an absolutely true statement and ignorance or genius, as long as I can go back and listen to music from 25 years ago, I'm comforted. It doesn't mean shit what you're saying. Well, Brian, let's give our perspective, because I assume that our okay. podcast will be around in the year 2030. So 11 years from now, when we record the first podcast episode in 2030, at that point... <laughs> What will we be listening to? What will metal music be? What bands will be will we be seeing touring? Well, if the trends that you call metal these days continue, I would imagine some dude making farting noises under his arm through a microphone distorted is going to be called metal. It will be unrecognizable if the trend continues, as as sometimes change happens. And I, I, I learned to I grow. Uh, it, Grand, it takes me longer, but I grow into new music and new metal, and I love it. But I resist it. I have no doubt that it will sound hard. It'll still have various tempos with a, 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 a huge array of vocalist styles. Uh, I'm afraid to say this, but I think there'll be more synth and more uh, techno in it. I, I mean... It, the trend happens that it's disturbing when Saxon plays with an orchestra. That doesn't bode well for the future of metal for me, but I'll grow to love it, I'm sure. I mean, to me, that is the a perfect future of metal. To me, it was the natural advancement. I almost might say that Saxon was limping around minus a leg, and then finally they realized, oh, wait, our sound is should be symphonic. And they added that now they can walk cleanly. Similarly, I think that heavy metal is in a great position. It started out like the Ugly Duckling, missing some of its parts back in the 80s. Just kind of a distorted, perverse version of its true self. It's now in its adolescent phase. It's still somewhat rough around the edges. But I think by 2030, metal will become perfected the ultimate oh form God. of music. When I hear shit like that, it makes me want to blow off the bottom half of my body so that I can find some sort of comfort in the metal that I love, because I know that shit ain't going to do it. Well, Brian, let's step away a moment for some music. This, the track The Fallen Queen by female-fronted symphonic power metal clan Tiger's Claw off their 2019 album Force of Destiny. And then when we return, we have some listener feedback to discuss.
International metal conglomerate Tiger Claw with The Fallen Queen from the album Force of Destiny. Uh, when I heard The Fallen Queen, I was extremely attracted to the sound. Uh, I, I would like a little more tempo, uh, but that's always uh, my case. Uh, I, I really like this. I think there's great potential in this band. I would encourage you to check it out, and I'm going to check out the entire album. So, Brian, occasionally we get some listener feedback. And recently, we had some feedback from one of our podcasts from back in 2018, where I reviewed the Nightwish concert in Covington, Kentucky. Uh, this guy's my hero. In my review of that, I came across, and you may be surprised at this, somewhat critical of metal from the past. Hmm. Speaking of blowing you in half, but go ahead. In response, our listener said, and I quote, I will seek you out and kick you in the nuts if you go putting down bands like Pantera and Slayer. 
who basically created the metal scene. Now, I've got a lot to say in response to this. Oh, that surprises me. Who knew you were going to trash 80s metal? Go ahead. You're going to say it anyway. Yeah, so I'll just say this. Like, I've seen Pantera and Slayer live. And while I would agree that both bands are metal, and indeed, I like both bands, the idea that they are the progenitors of metal is laughable. Really? Why is that? Both are arguably niche metal bands. Pantera and Slayer represent a form of metal that is very Americanized. Of course, as we can both agree... Metal is a European phenomenon. Metal no, 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 hails, no, 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 no. Stop, stop. We're, we don't agree on that, but go metal, ahead. Metal hails from the continent. And indeed, most of the great metal is from the northern European latitudes, from Scandinavia. Oh, God. The idea, if Pantera and Slayer had never existed... Metal would be just fine. And oh my God. It, and while, while I like them both, they are essentially both mere footnotes in the history of metal. Yeah, yeah. Mere footnotes. That, that's really what you're going to say about those two bands in particular. Listen, yes. listen, dumbass. Pop stars wear Slayer shirts, even though they don't know the music. Because oh, they are yeah, so exactly. iconic you prove, you in this country for point. metal. You prove my point. Yeah, you're welcome. No, what I've proven is that everybody knows who they are. They're not mere footnotes. They cross the lines of all this country. Uh, by the way, you said the, the northern part of the continent up in Norway and Sweden and such. Are you a Norwegian black metal fan? Absolutely. Were you by chance around Notre Dame uh, Church recently? On the advice of counsel, I'm not allowed to comment on that. Dude, I cannot believe that you're saying this shit. You are such a traitor to your sound. You, you, There's you no have traitor. no. You, I you, am true. T R V E to my sound. Oh my God, you're true to the next popular sound. Well, that one goes away. Thirty years from now, we'll be you, having this discussion you, where you, you said just, I didn't like. I didn't like uh, Floor Jansen. I didn't think Floor Jansen was a good uh, singer. I guarantee you, we'll have that discussion. You just literally just cited how pop stars wear Slayer merch. And then you talk about popularity. Again, the American sound is oh, what I is I the American sound is what is simply based on pop culture and popularity. Go to Back Europe. To this dumbass Europe. argument that saying that metal can't be popular. Metal, is, metal is Europe. Metal is European. Oh my god. Metal is up your ass because that sounds like the only place that you like it. Good Lord, dude. You have such a narrow-minded view. You're, you are, you, I'll say it again, you're a metal snob. Dude, the idea that Pantera and Slayer, quote, created the scene is the ultimate in metal snobbery because it elevates these two niche bands to a place that they frankly don't deserve. Oh, my God. Listen, I'm not saying that I agree with this guy that those two bands created the genre, but they are a massive part of the genre, both popular and yet rebellious in the same voice. And let me just say that hunting someone down and kicking them in the nuts of over metal is so metal. And I got to appreciate this guy. Most metal bands that are around today are not influenced by either Pantera or Slayer. They are mere minor notes in the grand symphony of metal. And the chorus would remain the same if they had never existed. You know what, man? I'm not going to change your mind. I'll just say this. If I was gay, I'd right swipe that dude on Grinder, And that's my final thought on it. Our final steaming track of metal for the podcast is from Slovakian symphonic black metal tribe Owen. Valley of Dry Bones.
from their 2017 album Mortal Man. That was the song Valley of Dry Bones by Owen. Man, I tell you what, any any band that labels itself uh, Slovakian black metal uh, has a place in my heart. I can guarantee you that this is one of your favorite songs that you heard this week. This is your kind of song, isn't it, brother? Closing out the show, a reminder you can check out all our content, debate shows, artist interviews, and fan casts on iTunes, SoundCloud, and YouTube. And make sure to follow us on all our social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just search Metal Debate to find us online. Until our next podcast, sell your soul for metal and defend it till your dying day. <laughs>